OK. Um, so what is a ward boundary review? Simple kind of question, I suppose. But this is a task, as I put it here, to, to develop units of representation. In, in Hamilton's case, wards that each elect one person. That's a unit of representation. We're, we're trying to develop those that reflect the distribution of the inhabitants of the municipality for electoral purposes. And the point of that, this has got nothing to do with where the buses are going to go. It's got nothing to do with which garbage is collected on which day. It's strictly about how we elect members of council. What lines do we use to get that exercise? Wards are a means to an end, the end being a number of councillors around a table who will make decisions on behalf of the community. They don't change the municipality in, other, in any other way. They don't change the neighborhoods or things of that sort. Uh, word boundary reviews are needed, I think, on a periodic basis because, of course, communities change. Municipalities change with the, with the uh, increase in population, with new development of various kinds. Sometimes we need to step back and just make sure that the systems of representation monitor, man uh, reflect, rather, where the community happens to be at any particular time. You will all be aware, of course, that this happens nationally and provincially on a regular cycle, every 10 years. Boundaries are reviewed to take account of changes in population. Municipally, here in Hamilton, it hasn't happened in, in 15 years since the amalgamated city was created. So on that cycle, it, it's time to do it. So we need to look at it to bring it together. Now, the background that, that I want to just share quickly is the City of Hamilton Act in 1999, which was the act that created the amalgamated city, provided for 13 wards. That's what the legislation says. However, between then and the actual implementation of the new city, by provincial regulation, it was changed to 15 wards. Not quite sure how, or where, or who did it, but it changed. So there were 15 wards determined. Eight of them were in the old city of Hamilton. Those wards that had been in place, as I noted here, since 1985 were not changed. They were simply taken from the city of Hamilton and transplanted into the new city of Hamilton. Seven wards were created in, and the language varies, is it the suburban area, the rural area, whatever. There were seven other wards created. And those tend to reflect the pre-amalgamation municipalities. They were not designed to reflect the population of those areas, even within them, let alone the population of the whole city. So they were, they were done in part of that amalgamation to give those pre-amalgamation municipalities a continuing place around the council table. So it was based on uh, pr putting a priority on a certain kind of, of, of value, if I can call it that. So there's the current structure, uh, the current uh, pattern, as, as we note at the top there. They do vary widely in terms of population. That's, that's certainly an issue that, that I don't think anyone would, would dispute. The land areas and the land use structures are quite different. There are wards that are virtually entirely rural, others that are entirely urban, and some that are somewhere in between in a transition from one to the other. So they're quite a mix of wards based, though, as I said a moment ago, based on, in one case, what things looked like in 1985, and in the other case, and what they looked like in 2000. So since 2001, Hamilton's population has grown. 9% uh, is, is the figure that we're working with. And so it's important, I think, that the boundary structure reflects the changing nature of the city. I use a word here that I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, if Let's call, I'm going to call it the optimal size. Nobody wants to be called the average ward, <laughs> but, but it's the same word. If the average ward should be 37,600, roughly, and we accept that there's some variation possible, and I'll explain that in a moment, then if we use that measure, two of the wards are more than 25% above that optimal size, and three are more than 25% below. So even with a very wide range of variation, there is five wards that fall outside what we might normally see as a, a reasonable distribution. There, there has been change already, 
And as we suggest here, there will be even more change in certain concentrated areas, and that's... Those are the blobs, if you will, on, on the map there. Those are areas that, that will be high population growth. Not the only places where there's growth, but the highest growth will be there. And you're right, water down is, is certainly one of those. And, and others uh, will be transforming rural areas into something quite different. So, uh, and the, the anticipated growth is roughly 12% over the next decade. So that, we've already had nine, we're looking at another 12. And the forecast shows the greatest growth in wards 11, 9, and 15. So, while we have an imbalance already, this is going to contribute to an even greater imbalance. And again, that's why we need to step back and say, all right, what... is that... is that still appropriate? Okay. Now, I, I want to just remind us that this is a routine process at the national and provincial level. Ward boundaries and the whole distribution of electoral uh, uh, lines are part of a routine process that are part of, of, of our democratic process, generally speaking. And I think it's a legitimate expectation of all of you that your representation system will be effective. You have a chance to be heard. It is equitable, that is, it's fair to all of you. And it's an accurate reflection of the contemporary distribution of the communities and the people within the city. Does it capture where you are. So, what we're doing is not coming up with some idea that, that has no basis in fact or no basis in, in, in uh, 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 let's call it in our value system. We're simply trying to adjust where things are electorally to take account of that. Now, one other background piece that we need to look at is that these actions are taken under the auspices of, of the city but the city's powers are determined in legislation. The Municipal Act in Section 217 authorizes the council to establish the number of councillors and de to determine how they should be elected, as in one-member wards, two-member wards, other, other versions. And in Section 222, the council has the authority to, quote, divide or redivide the municipality into wards or to dissolve the existing wards. That is what council will be acting on. That power. And the important point is that it's council that makes that decision. As I said, the legislation gives the power to the municipality. That's all it says. There's nothing else in the legislation that says how often it needs to be done, how it needs to be done, what kinds of, of things to take into account. Every process is individual, if I can call it that. Each municipality must set its own terms of reference, its own parameters, its own guiding principles. So we will work under the principles and parameters set by Hamilton City Council through a, through a report from the clerk that set this up. However, that review is framed around a number of procedures and principles that, that have been applied in a number of municipalities across Ontario. They have a status, if you will. They have validity uh, in terms of the principles, in terms of the, the kinds of consultation we're doing. Uh, the municipal board has endorsed certain kinds of decisions and has paid attention to certain uh, perspectives that we will be mindful of as, as we move forward. So, in the case of, of this particular review, this particular ward review, there were six principles established uh, in, in beginning the process. And I'll read them quickly, but I'll explain them a bit further. Representation by population. Population and electoral trends. The means of communication and accessibility. Geographic and topographical features. Community or diversity of interests. And effective representation. Now, most of those are fairly straightforward. But just to be clear, we are seeking, as best we can, an equal number of constituents Within, with a degree of variation. That's, that's the, the, one of the goals, to try to create parity. May not be possible, but that, that is a principle that we are asked to try to build into a, to a system. Achieve a degree of parity, and that's where my reference to an optimal ward is. Clustering around that size would create parity, but variation of about 25% is going to be our working number for a degree of, of variation. Population and electoral trends. If we can get things to work out with the current, current population, 
we want to make sure that as we move out over the next decade, we won't have to do this over again right away. We will know where those growth areas are, and we will build that into to the designs we have. The means of communication, essentially we're designing wards around existing transportation and commun communication markers, as I would call them, uh, and networks where they're possible. We, we would not draw lines along uh, neighborhood streets. We would use major roadways. We would use significant transportation connections as potential boundaries where we can. Geographical and topographical features, well, of course, in, when we talk about Hamilton, we know what that is. Uh, we have to pay a lot of attention to, to uh, the escarpment and the way the city's life revolves around, around that in terms of its transportation, in terms of other kinds of things. We want to see whether we can make use of that. And community and diversity of interests, clearly, there's more than 15 communities in Hamilton. There are more than 15 neighborhoods, but there are only 15 wards. So we're not going to draw lines that slice those communities in half or, or chop them apart from one another. We're going to keep communities together, but then we have to decide which ones to, to put together in a ward. So our community and diversity of interest is looking at drawing boundary lines around communities of interest, not through them, and assembling groups in such a way that, that we can achieve effective representation. So effective representation is, is a uh, component of this that is very uh, uh, much more abstract, perhaps, but it's essentially a, a phrase that comes out of a Supreme Court decision uh, related to electoral boundaries. And it basically is talking about what the right to vote actually means. Eric, could I have the next slide? Uh, in that decision, the court ruled that you can move away from parity, from equality, if there's compelling reasons to do so. And part of that has to do with the distribution of population. As long as, in the end, citizens with distinct interests have a voice in the legislative process, and they can get effective assistance from their representatives. And that comes back to part of the question of how large a ward is, and, and, and how much uh, you have a chance to be heard in the making of decisions. Okay, here's where we are, phase two, public uh, workshops. Uh, we will be doing those now, and when we've come up with some designs, which was going to be, uh, we think, around June, we will do this again. Uh, and, and those uh, will lead on toward a final report to council, which we're gonna aim for uh, in, in uh, October. There will be information made available as we move along, timetables for the next set of meetings, uh, and other ways of collecting information. There, there is a, uh, uh, a Twitter feed that can be used. There is another form of, of uh, feedback that is, uh, I think, available on the website, too.